Okay. You, you, you know a whole lot. I think you just touched on some of the issues that uh, they, they can also look into when it comes to information that they can pass to the civil population uh, in that part of uh, the country. Because if truly some of them receive letters, the recipients of such letters, who are they? Uh, either the heads, the district heads, the chiefs, or the religious leaders in such communities. And when they do receive them, who should they be uh, reporting to uh, before such uh, attacks are carried out by Boko Haram? By virtue of those positions they hold, either as religious leaders, Syracuse or whatever, they already have links with government authorities, be they military, police, whatever, and so on. Okay, they know how to channel these things across. They have linkages already. They, have, they already have links. In most cases, when things like this are ongoing, when the military is on ground, they look for the leadership and try to get in touch with them because that is how you can reach out to the community. And the army is so well structured and organized in such a way that even in the course of your training, you know all this basically as an officer. You know, for some time now, we haven't heard of any attack or major attack or until this recent it's, one. Yes, and that's why I called it pockets of, uh, uh, you know. What, what is it you think we can do to sustain it? Because uh, ultimately, uh, we have all, always maintained, uh, and I'm quite sure you, you're still on the same page with Nigerians, that uh, this relative peace and success garnered by, garnered by the military uh, would amount to not for some people, especially the families of those uh, that we're still looking for, the Chibo girls and some other girls missing in Nigeria's northeast. Outside intelligence, which we have overflogged, so to speak, I expect that all our PTIs will begin to ensure that we are able to create and establish them. I mean, preventive terrorism uh, initiatives, okay? And um, we begin to take a good look at all the reports that have emanated from past incidents, okay, and try to see how we actually implement these reports. For us, for instance, do all DPOs, as we speak today, do they have counter-terrorist liaison uh, or officers' desk in their in their divisions? And if they do, are the guys just seated there, or they are actually liaison? with their immediate communities to ensure that what needs to be done at the various soft targets are done, okay? You walk into a lot of parks as we speak now, motor parks, and you see that certain things that should be there are not there. Do we see that? And, and these are the, where they refer to as soft targets. Uh, yes, please. And then we ask yourself, so look, what happens? Because that's, they attack time and again. Mm -hmm. And that's why I keep asking, look, apart from all our military strategies to ensure they cannot carry out spectacular attacks, yeah. those soft targets, are we seen to be doing anything to protect them from attacks? That is what I'm saying. The counter-terrorist liaison officers and even the DPOs themselves should move out, marry up with the security management committees of these soft targets, be they motor parks, be they our markets, and so on, and try to ask certain questions. Why have you not placed, put this in place? Why have you not put this in place? Check them, tell, show them what to do, and so on. We should be doing all that. Governors should be disturbed that motor parks within their states are not protected. Because Why are they not fenced? A lot of motor parks, you know, are not fenced. You can access level, them from every direction. Uh, yes, I, I'm happy we're talking about the soft targets because uh, it was uh, Lieutenant, uh, a retired le flight Lieutenant Terry Ajobina who came on this program and he said something about critical national infrastructure. Yeah. And it would seem as if uh, we haven't been able to do more of that, keeping our eyes on them, keeping watch over them. For instance, what has just happened in Niger Delta uh, with the pipeline that was blown up. These are critical national assets infrastructure, yeah. and infrastructure assets for the country. And we have them dotted around every state of the Federation. Yeah. This is away from the military now. You talked about intelligence. What should we be doing in safeguarding some of this, uh, plus the parks and our markets? That's what I was saying just before you came in, okay? These various parks should have, in place, first of all, we should have the perimeter fencing. So that to an extent, 
once you have your per perimeter fencing, you have limited entry points. You can now check everybody who is coming in. At the entry point, you have all what you need to check vehicles underneath and so on. And then the, 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 the uh, what's it called now? The, 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 we also need scanners in our motor Of course, of course. You need scanners, you need bomb jammers, okay? And so on. There are lots of preventive security equipment you can put in place, depending on how rich the pack is or how much of intervention the state government wants or local government wants to bring into bear at such parks, such markets, and so on. All right? Do you, think, do you think we should also be uh, needing the uh, collaboration of the transport ministry on this? Of course. You carry all stakeholders along. All stakeholders must be carried along, even the unions, the road transport unions, and so on. You carry everybody along. Look, this insurgency thing is a national problem. It's not just something for the military alone or security agencies alone. The way we are often, you know, up to see it, you know, and, 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 and by so doing, we, we just fold our arms and believe, look, the military should do its job, the police should do its job. Everybody should be involved. You know, there's another dimension that raises a lot of concern lately, uh, mm -hmm. and that is, I mean, recently you hear about the report of uh, Fulani herdsmen killing a traditional ruler in Delta State. And then if you cast your mind back to when Chief Olufale was abducted and how the scenario played out, you ask yourself, are these just Fulani herdsmen? Are they really Fulani herdsmen? Because if they are working with certain people, they know who to target, how to go about it, and... Some of those accounts say, look, there's some sort of training, awareness in terms of what to do, how to use some of those weapons. This is a concern, and one wonders, who's addressing this? I expect government to look into that for quite some while now, even in the last dispensation. I know a lot has been said about this. How come these guys are even armed? They, are, they carry automatic weapons around. <clears throat> how come? Where did they get them from? I can understand being armed with bow and arrow. That's what we know the traditional Fulani man to always be armed with and so on. But how come today, in the name of a cattle, they all carry it? Because well, if well, Mr. Yeah. says, look, these are not Fulani herdsmen, then who are they? That's because we should be asking. I think that's a tax to our intelligence. <laughs>